And we're going to read Psalms 37, 1 through 11. I'd like you to make note of that. Maybe something you want to read at home. It has more than we can cover in just a few minutes today. Psalms 37, 1 through 11. Do not fret because of evil men, or be envious of those who do wrong. For like the grass, they will soon wither. Like green plants, they will soon die away. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and enjoy safe pasture. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will do this. He will take your righteousness, and he will make your righteousness shine like the dawn and the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when men succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. Refrain from anger and turn from wrath. Do not fret, it leads only to evil. For evil men will be cut off, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. A little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look for them, they will not be found. But the meek will inherit the land and enjoy great peace. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading and understanding of his word. A man was at an airport one day, and he was late. He just knew he was going to miss his plane. He was running, and he was carrying all of his baggages, and he was a-huffing, and he was a-puffing, trying to get to where he was supposed to go, and he ran into a man wearing a uniform. And he dropped all of his bags and everything, and the kind man started helping him pick them up. He says, where in the world are you going in such a hurry? And the guy said, oh, I'm late for my flight. I know I'm going to miss it, and this is going to happen, and that's going to happen. And he says, I'm flying on flight such and such. And the guy smiled, and he says, you have nothing to fear, mister. He says, I'm the pilot of that plane. <laughs> and you're not going to miss the plane because you're with me. There's a moral to that story. The moral of the story is this. If the pilot is a chillin', you can be a chillin'. Our Lord and Savior is the pilot of this land and of this life and of your life. And he is a chillin'. <laughs> He's not worried. His hands aren't being wrung. He's going, oh my, I didn't know this was going to happen. Everything's going on in our world today. He knew about it. And he's chilling. And if he's the pilot of your life, you can be chilling too. There's a very important message today that I would like to share with you about stress and worry. The kids and I have already showed you all the faces of worry. But you and I know them probably better than they do. So today, we're looking at our number one, our first blank, Revealing the truth about worry. Revealing the truth about worry. Here's number one. It sounds easy. Worry is choosing not to trust God. That's what worry is. Every time we catch ourselves worrying, it simply means we don't trust God. A, our scripture started out with something very interesting. It said, never envy what unbelievers have. Never envy about what unbelievers have. Verse 1 says, do not fret because of those who are evil or be envious of those who are evil. It seems like those that have no conscience 
no sense of right or wrong, have the most. It seems that way. Those of us that are trying to follow the rules and regulations and doing the things we're supposed to do, we don't seem to have that much. But fretting is a very destructive emotion. And what it does is it puts our focus on others instead of God. If we're constantly thinking about what someone else has, or why can't I, or why must I, and why can't they, or why do they, we're not thinking about God, are we? Some ungodly people seem extremely popular or extremely rich, but it seems that way. We know really many of them are very, very unhappy. They may be in the green pastures on the outside, but on the inside they're searching for something they don't have. And just as the scripture says, verse 2 said, these green pastures will fade. They will dry up. They will wither away, just like the grass, just like all the things of the world. And they will go away. But we as believers are different than they are. Our priorities are different. Our thoughts are different. Our love is different. And what we have is eternal. It will never go away. So here's your next question. In the end, we have, will have far greater treasures in heaven. And they will last forever. That's why the scriptures tell us this over and over again. So many different scriptures it says, build your treasures in heaven and not on earth. Because they will last forever. B, worry can be harmful in our lives. I'm going to give you five different things that worry can do that's not good. Number one, it can damage your health. Hospitals are full of people that have worried themselves sick. Remember that? We always say that, you don't worry me sick. Well, it's working. It's happened. We worry ourselves until things don't work right in our body. And we could go into statistics and all kinds of things, but we are in a world and we are in a nation of many sick people because of worry. Number two, it can consume our thoughts. If all we think about, all we worry about, we're not thinking about who we can help. We're not thinking about what God wants us to do. We're not thinking about a way we can praise him or the neighbor that needs help because we're worrying. It consumes us, which leads us to the third one. It disrupts, it disrupts our productivity. Productivity. We can't be doing things we should be doing if all we're doing is worrying because that's what's on our mind. That's what's on our hearts. Not doing things, helping one, forgiving, praying, whatever it might be. Because all we're thinking about is what I'm worried about. It affects the way, number four, how you treat others. Oh, boy. Ruthie will say, why are you so, why are you so grumpy? What are you worried about? And there's usually something I'm worried about. We treat people a different way when that's all that we can think about. On our minds or concerns and worries, we're not going to be the kind hearted people they want us to be or God wants us to be. Which leads us to number five it keeps us from trusting God. It keeps us from trusting God. Now, sometimes we need to be concerned. I've told you about my great grandmother, a wonderful woman, lived right over here, not too far from uh, some of you guys, uh, over toward Farmer. All kinds of things happened in her lifetime. She went from horseback or a buggy to riding a jet airplane before she died. But she was never worried because that was a sin. But she was oftentimes concerned. Now, I have an example. I was going to embarrass somebody here. Uh, Bonnie's not paying attention, so we'll, we'll talk about her. 
At the church board meeting the other day, everybody was there that was going to be there at 7, except for Bonnie. Now, that bothered us because Bonnie is never late, ever. She is timely. So we didn't worry, but we were concerned. So instead of just sitting there with foot, uh, doing our thumbs and everything, uh, Diane, of course, we can do that now. We just called up and said, hey, uh, you OK, Bonnie? <laughs> and she'd just forgotten the time had been changed as well. But oftentimes, we need to be concerned. But there's a difference between worry and concern. And here it is. Another question. Worry symbolizes, or worry immobilizes. It keeps us from doing all the things that we talked about. It immobilizes. But concern moves us to action. And that's what we do all the time. We're going to be doing it here in a little while about the supper. It, we don't sit there and worry about it. We move to action. And don't worry. Number two, don't worry, but take delight. Now, that was our scripture, verse 4. Don't, A, don't focus on what we cannot do, but focus on what God can do. Focus on what God can do. Now, look, let's look at Psalms 34, 4. It says, delight in the Lord. What does that mean? Well, here's what delight is, if you want to write it on the back of your thing. It says, to delight in someone means to experience great pleasure and joy in their presence. That's a good thing to remember. You need to put that on your, uh, on your refrigerator. To delight in the Lord is to the, is someone is to means to experience great pleasure and joy in their presence. And it only happens if you know that person well. So we need to have delight in the Lord. But before we can do that, we must know him. Know him well through his word, through his Bible, through our prayers, and through our talking to him. So we can know Jesus better. Your next question, knowledge of God's great love for us will, underline that word will, indeed give us delight. Now let's look at Psalms 37, 5. Another interesting one. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Now what does that mean? Well, commit means entrusting everything of our lives to God. We entrust our families. We trust our finances. We entrust everything. Our jobs, our possessions, to His control and guidelines. We entrust, that's what it means, is to entrust everything to Him. And yes, that even means COVID-19 and elections of 2020. Control and his guidance. We put it in his control and guidance. We, uh, we have a lot to commit to his trust right now many sicknesses and illnesses, and we know all the things that's going on in our land. But we have a big God, and we can bring it all to him. He's big enough for every single problem that we have. Our personal problems, our nation's problems, our, all of our problems, our world problems. He's bringing it on, and says, he says, bring it to me. Bring your burden and, and cares to me. Stinky bug. Ooh. Psalms 55, 22. I won't make you look it up, but listen to this. Cast your burdens upon the Lord, and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. Bring your burdens to Jesus. B, 
Replace worry with prayer. Replace worry with prayer. Go to Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition and with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Almost every time when we pray, you probably notice the very first thing that we do is we thank God for what we've had and what we have and what we're going to have. And then we present our petitions to him. Guide us and direct us and all those things. We all have worries on our jobs, our, our worries of our homes, worries of our school, schools. But Paul says, turn your worries into prayers. Every situation, it says. It says all. Did you see that? In every situation. Several years ago, I won't mention her name. I embarrass her. But I had a young mother come to me. And she says, I'm so worried about my little boy. Of course, I knew them both really well. He says he's in kindergarten, and he cries all the time. He hates it, he's scared, he doesn't want to go, he screams, he, he fights, I have to pull him, we've done that, remember, you have to pull him off of you, you know, and get him in there. And she says it's been going on for weeks. I've taken them to the doctor, and they said he has uh, separation anxiety. Well, you know, we can, put an, uh, <laughs> we can put a title on anything, it just meant he misses his mama. And she says, I don't know what to do. And I said, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. She goes, oh, okay. So we prayed. That was Sunday. Monday, she said, he cried and he screamed. And she had to peel him off and everything. He comes home Monday evening and he goes, Mom, I really love school. I love school. And she never had another word. And she says, Bobby, prayer works. I said, I know. Every situation. Particular petitions. We can ask you. We don't have to have roundabout things. Just, Lord, uh, you know, make me this or make me that. But particular things. Help my son not be scared of school. <laughs> Help me with this. Help me. He wants to hear your particular petitions. Your last one on this is the greatest antidote for worry is prayer. The greatest antidote is prayer. See, God's peace can replace worry. God's peace can replace worry. God's peace is different than the world. We know the Bible tells us that. It's a different kind of peace. Let's look at it. John 14, 27. John 14, 27. Jesus says, before he's getting ready to leave this earth, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you the, what the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. The result of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives is gives us deep and lasting peace. Now what the world gives is temporary. And it's usually defined, peace defined by the world is absence of conflict. If there's no wars going on, if everybody in the family is happy and no one's, uh, then that's peace. But that's not what Christ said. Christ's peace, as we have, is no need to fear the present or the future. Folks, there is always a war within us going on. Satan makes sure of that. Sin, fear, uncertainty, doubt, numerous other forces are at work and at war within us. But the peace of God moves in our hearts and in our lives. It can restrain those hostile forces and replace them with comfort and peace. 
Jesus said, as I read a while ago, I will give you that peace if we are willing to accept it from him. True peace is not found in positive thinking as someone will teach and, and show you. It's not our feelings. Oftentimes our feelings are wrong. But it comes from knowing that God is in control. Last question, or one of your last ones. Let God's peace guard your heart against anxiety. Let God's peace guard your heart. So as we've already learned, what is the remedy of all this worry? Number one, focus on what God can do. Not what I can't do, not what the others have, not what they've got, not what I could have, but on what God can do. Replace your anxiety with prayer. Come to the Lord in prayer, the Bible says. And then this will happen. The peace beyond understanding will come unto you. What a blessing. What a blessing. Back some years ago, a name, if you heard it, would make you shiver in your boots. Al Capone. Good reason. He was a mob boss, as you know. Terrorizing cities. Crime everywhere. Gangsters. And with good reason, because Scarface himself had beaten three of his subordinates to death with a ball bat at one time. And of course, behind many murders. But that view wasn't always the same. Back in the 1920s, people thought highly of him, even though he was a criminal. They respected him, kind of a, a, a Robin Hood type of fellow, they thought. In fact, one university, Northwest University of School of Journalism, wanted to have his name put up on the wall as one of the outstanding people of the world, along with Gandhi and Einstein. But as many, his power was short-lived. In 1931, he served six years in the, in, uh, the Alcatraz prison. Eight years after that, he released, he was released suffering from advanced stages of syphilis. He lived just a few years more as a recluse and died in 1947. Now while he was in prison there in Alcatraz, he had a roommate, but Capone was a shoe repairman in prison. He shared with the other convict was a prison newspaper man for the prison newspaper. And Capone said to him one day, he says, look at us. He says, I'm supposed to be a big shot, a mob boss. And here I am in a shoe shop. He says, you're supposed to be a respected safe cracker. And you're writing articles in the paper. He says, what kind of screwed up, lousy world is this? And the other guy had turned to Christ years before. And he told him this. This world is a place where those who violate God's law may flourish for a season but their days are numbered. Sooner or later, on this earth, or in the great judgment seat of God, evildoers will pay for their evil ways. How truthful that is today. Today, you and I may be extremely fretful. We may be fretting over the things that we've seen in the past few weeks. We're angry, we're worried, we're jealous. But those things should not be in the Christian vocabulary. Faith, trust, 
hope and peace should be in our vocabulary. God's peace. God's peace, Jesus' peace, it goes beyond understanding will replace our worries. Look, but look at Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Philippians 4, 6 through 7. <laughs> Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Remember this. Unrighteous people will flourish for a season. But God's people will flourish for eternity. Amen. And amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you know all the things that's going on in our world today. You know the sicknesses and the illnesses. You know the pain and suffering. You know the concerns about our nation the divisions that's in our nation that we've never seen before. But you know about them all and you have a conclusion. You have an end to it all. Nothing is surprising you and you have it in control. Help us, O oh Lord, to understand that as the coming days, the coming weeks, and the coming years as we patiently wait for Christ to come. He will judge the unrighteous Reward the righteous. And may we be looking forward to seeing Jesus' face. Amen. And amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 428. And that happens to be Heavenly Sunlight. Heavenly Sunlight. Anyone would like to join our church or dedicate their lives to Christ may come forward during this hymn. And it's uh, first and last. Yes. All right, first and last first. <laughs>